Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. You know, that whole idea of patience isn't bite the bullet like that old Western who's going to have something cut out of him. It's that cowboy's biting that bullet. But for you and me, we're to do it with joy. It's to stand. Listen carefully. When we go through this to fortify our patience, when we go through the trial, what do you think is the normal reaction when we go through some trials? The normal reaction is to flee from them. Flee from a marriage, flee from a job, flee from the trials. And sometimes God says, In certain kind of trials, you need to stay right there and gain as much as I have for you. Listen to the phrase. The trial of your faith is more precious than gold. We all say amen to that. If that's true, and it is, then that could mean that the more trials I have and the more I endure that trial, the more gold result in my life it will bring. So here's my prayer. My prayer is, Lord, get me out of this trial. My prayer is this, Lord, give me the patience to cheerfully endure this until I've learned every lesson I possibly can. And once that's done, then you remove the trial in your way. Watch. Because once I make it through that trial, that was like through my freshman year of trial college. Because then I go to a sophomore year of trial college. And then my junior year of trial college. And I'm going to be in God's school of trials as I go up the ladder. But you know what? It's an education I'm getting so that I become more useful in my ministry and life for Him. Those trials are part of God's wonderful purpose. So with patience and endurance, we stand fast in them. We don't run quickly from them. All right, let's look at another one. Number three, problems sanctify our character. It also means to set us apart. They're to make us more like Christ. They help me to grow in maturity. God's number one purpose in my life, in your life, is to make us like Christ. You know the verse that says, all things work together for good to those that are called according to his purpose. And later on it says that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. When that phrase says all things, we like to think all good things. Actually, it says all things, the good, the bad, and the ugly, including the trials, have purpose to make us more and more like Christ. So right now, go back to the trial that you put in your mind's eye, and I want you to just say, Lord, I want to thank you at this very moment for the trial that you've given to me. I want, though, you to help me to get through this trial and learn every spiritual lesson I can. Make me a better woman. Make me a better mother. Make me a better wife. Make me a better man. Make me a better husband. Make me a better father. Lord, make me like you. And I'm going to tell you that God's going to say, that's the kind of trial. You're responding right. So don't fight God's scalpel in your life while he's trying to dig out of your life something that shouldn't be there. You lay there, allow God to bring that about, and you'll have healing. On the other side, sometimes he's going to cut into you not to take something that you've done wrong out of your life, so don't walk with all guilt, but let God operate on you with the scalpel of a trial because he wants to put something in your life to enhance your life, to give you both quality of life and a quantity of spiritual life. But allow God, that great physician, to use the balm in Gilead to touch your heart and soul, to make you exactly what God wants you to be. You have purpose. You're important. You're special with God. And that's why he's making you the way he is. There's two things that he often uses to help sanctify our character. One is the word of God. So the more you're in God's word, it'll help you. I'm reminded of what David said in Psalm 119. He said this, it is good for me that I've been afflicted. Let's change that. It is good for me that I have trials. The rest of the verse says, so that I might learn your statutes. So in other words, God says, I've given you the trials, so you'll learn the word. When you learn the word, you become more usable, more effective for me and for my glory. So the trial is just bringing us into the word. But sometimes when we go through trials, we get angry at God, don't we? And God says, no, just rest in him. The second thing that he uses would be the circumstances of life. And there are a lot of circumstances of life that he'll choose to use in our life. And whatever they might be, I want you to know that whatever trial you have, listen, 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 listen. He's a doctor that when you need surgery, he doesn't take the scalpel. As much as you might feel the pain, 
He doesn't come and go. He's not a mean doctor. He takes it. He knows exactly what you need. And with the, with the scalpel held by a hand of the greatest lover that you'll ever have, he begins to cut through the issues. Feeling your pain as if he was cutting on himself with that trial to put something in, to take something out, so that you then would be all that God wants you to be. And those are the circumstances of life. And boy, he sure does it. He does it in my life, and he'll do it in everyone else's life. Those are three things you need to know. Let me give you a couple things you need to do, and we'll be closed for today. All right? These are some things you need to do. How to triumph from your trials. Number one is you need to rejoice. Now, that sounds weird. I threw that out so quickly, but you do need to rejoice. The verse says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials. Now, they have, for those of us that struggle with cholesterol that's still like bacon, they have this thing on the market. What kind of bacon is that called? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I think it's called fake and bacon. Is that what it's called? Or is that the thing you give to your dog? I can't remember. There's something that smells like bacon, but you give to your dog or you eat yourself. It's called fake and bacon. Well, I think there's a lot of fake and Christian zone out there. You know, they hear that. I got to have joy. So they're like, how are you doing? I'm doing really good. Praise God. Praise God. But I call that nothing more than Sin management, sin management, because inside you're still angry at God. You're, why me? Why this? Why now? What you really want to say is, why me? It should have been somebody else. That guy should have gotten this. Why this? It could have been something else. Why'd I have this? Why now? Well, if you want to do this, Lord, do it later, like the second before I die, do it. You know? And God says, no, no, no. We don't want fake and Christians. So you don't want to deny that you're in pain. If you do that, then you won't get all the help. And the spiritual maturity health that you need. So you've got to admit that you have it. But you have to consider it joy. Now the word consider is examine it, evaluate it, look at it. Now folks, this is hard because it requires humility. When you're going through the trial, most people will say, I'm going, the reason I've got this trial is because someone didn't do what they should be doing. They're the ones that should. And we begin to blame others that we suffer because of them. We become the victim. How many know what I mean if you do say, "Uh uh-huh? Okay, because we probably are there and like that. All right, now that's the uh uh-huh. Other people made this happen to me. If you want to learn and triumph from your trial, the first thing you might do is to look at the trial and say, you know what, I'm feeling some pain right here. This really, really bothers me. I'm really going through some deep weeds. So now your question isn't so much why. We already know why. Why? Why is he doing this? To purify us, make us more like him. So that's already settled. So now we have to say, all right, Lord, what do you want from me during this trial? First of all, Lord, would you reveal to me, is there any part that I played in this that brought this trial on myself because I was not walking with you? That I did not respond biblically to your word in yieldedness or or obedience? That I was doing whatever I was doing in the flesh and this caused a particular trial it's the cause and the effect it's the reaping and the sowing and so lord you know what i i did this i messed up it's my i take ownership of this now as soon as you do this here's what you do then you say lord this is what i did i confess it to you here's what god does two things first he says my son my daughter i forgive you thank you for owning up that's a good thing that you did The second thing he does is he gives us grace now so we can be exalted from those trials, again, becoming more like Christ. So what you're going to do is not to say, why? We already got that settled. Why? It's to purify us. It's now what? What can I learn from this? What lesson? What can I do to teach others? How can I magnify the wonder of a great God through this trial authentically? And for some of us, what we might need to do is not to try to do so much of it on our own with our plastic fake and bacon smile. It ought to be, Lord, I can't do this, but you can. I can't, you can, you're in me, so you will. You got all that? And so now you're yielding to him. And the Lord, then he loves this. He's working with you. You're gaining all that you can. Now the gold is starting to show in your life. That's because you're beginning to consider it, evaluate it. And what do you consider? It's joy. This is a good thing. Because good things are going to come from it. A changed life, more like Christ. God gets glorified and (laughs) rewards in heaven for you. A special crown. So consider that. There was a Jewish psychologist during the Nazi concentration and um, in the camp there. And he wrote this, and I'm going to read it from him. He said, they stripped me naked. They took everything, my wedding ring, my watch. I stood there naked 
And all of a sudden, I realized at that moment that although they could take everything away from me, my wife, my family, my possessions, they could not take away my freedom. You might say, whoa, 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 whoa. He was in concentration. Yeah, my freedom to choose how I was going to respond. That's rich. So no matter what you're going through, you might lose your job. You might lose your mate. You might lose your kids. You might lose your health. You might lose some of your friends. But they can't take away from you the joy of how to respond when you go through that trial. Genuine, Christ-like joy from His Spirit. And that's the joy that you can have. How do you do that? You have a spirit of saying, Lord, in everything, I'll give thanks. And Lord, I'll bless you at all times, even during the times of trial. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. That's another word of saying, happy am I and happy is your name. And I've got joy. Your name is everything. Through everything. Psalm 34, 1. I, I hope you think about that. Take a deliberate look at that. You ready for a little bit of a humorous story? I want to read this to you just to kind of I'll see if I have it here. <clears throat> it's humorous to us, but not to this guy. I got this out of a place called Strange and Unusual Events in 1982 from the Encyclopedia Britannica. I thought you guys might like to hear this. If you think you've got problems, Brian Heiss had more than his share of bad luck in July. His apartment in Provo, Utah became flooded from a broken pipe upstairs. Now, we know what that's like here because a couple of summers ago, we had a broken pipe on the second floor that wiped out the second floor and it rained into the first floor. So we kind of know a little bit. Then it says, the manager told him to go out and rent a water vacuum. That's when he discovered that his car had a flat tire. He changed it and went inside again and called a friend for help. From the electric shock he got from the phone, he inadvertently ripped the instrument from the wall. Before he could leave the apartment a second time, a neighbor, a neighbor he had, had to kick down his front door because the water damage now jammed it tightly closed. While all this was going on, someone stole his car outside that now had the new tire on it. But it was almost out of gas, so he found the car a few blocks away. But he had to push it to a gas station where, it filled, where he filled up his tank. That evening, Heiss attended a military ceremony at his university. He injured himself severely when he somehow sat on his bayonet that had got tossed in the front seat. The doctors were able to stitch up the wound, but no one was able to resuscitate four of his canaries who were crushed to death from falling plaster in his house. After he finally came home for the evening, he slipped on wet carpet and badly injured his tailbone. And he said that he began to wonder if God was trying to kill him but kept missing. I'm not, I don't want to make a joke out of that, but I'm going to tell you, you get pretty desperate. Now, we're rejoicing. Yeah, that happened to him. But no matter what trial it is, it is painful for the person that goes through it. And for that moment, I want you to know, folks, 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 put it into perspective. We could all be living in Afghanistan right now. We all could be in Iraq trying to begin a new life. And then you can throw us into any jungle in any area of some third world country. We're not. We're here. Our problems are real, but they still have perspective. So the first is to rejoice. After we move from rejoicing, the next thing that I think is important that we request, that we go to the Lord and we now begin to talk to Him. We talked a little about what to ask Him for, but you do have to request. Now this one I'm not going to unpack this week. I'm going to spend time next week unpacking the question, how do I make the right decision? Now it will be usually in the face of a trial. I've got a car that doesn't work. How do I know what to do? Should I buy a car, lease a car, fix this car? That's the right decision. Some of you are trying to decide, what do I do about where I live? That's a trial. What do I do? Some of you are trying to decide, I've got a problem with my health. Do I keep the same doctor? Do I go to a different one? What procedure should I take? How will I pay for this thing? You're going through trials. I'm going to show you how to make the right decision when you go through that. And I'm going to take a little bit from this verse here, but a whole lot more from James. So I just want you to know that when you go through the trial, again, continue your conversation of saying, okay, Lord, you permitted it or you prescribed it. Now, what do I do to honor you? And then finally, number three, and that is to rest. When he asks us, he says we need to just simply believe and not doubt. I hope that that's how we are, that we're just going to trust God. We're going to cooperate with God. Now, some of you in this church, some of you listening to me, you could be in God's hall of, not fame, but you could be in God's hall of pain. And what I'm hoping that 
perhaps through you resensing the bomb in Gilead, you would move from the hall of pain to the hall of praise. To say, God, whatever you do with me, it is okay, it is right, because you are God, you're the only God, and you're the good God, and I trust you in it. Now, for some of you, as you think about all of this, I want you to know that you do not have a God in heaven who has not been touched by his own degree of pain. Every issue that you will go through, he has gone through. Now, he didn't have a car that was stolen. I know that. But he knows what it's like to have something taken from him. Oh, he didn't get a, a divorce, but he knows what it's like to have someone that you think would be with you for all of your life desert you. He knows that. Some of you are going through physical pain through either surgery or disease. Well, he never had disease, never had surgery, but he knows everything there is about pain. Some of you have pain because of injustice on your job, and maybe even through the government. He knows all there is about injustice. So whatever you're going through, Jesus went through it, and you ramp it all up because, frankly, and I'm putting myself in your camp, we still deserve it. We're sinners. We messed up our life. We messed up others' lives. So if that happens to us, I'm sure we've done it to them in some measure. Jesus did nothing wrong. He was King of kings and Lord of lords. And he went through all of that. And some of us think about him dying on the cross. We saw the passion of the Christ. And I'd like for you to know that there's another part of the passion of the Christ that we ought not to overlook. He could have still died where his heart stopped beating. He could have died where a little prick on his arm and a little bit of blood would have been shed and it was perfect and then he come back to life again and did all that he did. But he went through the most horrific trial emotionally and physically and I don't want us to forget that. I think one of the reasons he went through that is so that he can show you as a God man physically. He says, whatever you go through, I can identify with you and then some. And he says, and yet through all of that, watch this. After he went through this, he rose again from the dead and he was highly exalted where every principality was put under him. And he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's resurrection life. That power that did that gives you the power to endure, yea, and rejoice during your trial now because you can make it, folks, in Christ because you are going to get a new body, a new life, a new kingdom that will never be taken away because you are his child and he's waiting for you in heaven. So I pray with all my heart, soul, and mind that if you need a bomb in Gilead, there's only one bomb in his Jesus Christ and I present him to you knowing that it works. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I want to have a moment of speaking to you with you just silently here. I want to speak about the greatest need that you have. I know finances are important now. You've got some issues. I know that maybe some relationships are painfully broken or needs to be restored. I'm not going to minimize that. But I want to go to the very end now. The greatest trial you face is the trial of the fear of where you're going to go when you die. And if you do not receive the balm of Jesus Christ, that ointment, his blood, and the forgiveness that it brings, then you think you've got trials now, friend? I wish I could wrap my arm around you and hold you when I tell you this. You haven't seen nothing yet until you die. Hell is so horrific that all the words in the Bible could not adequately express how horrifying it is. And yet, the worst part about being in hell is not the flames. It's not the pain. It's going to be that you will know forever that you are separated from the balm of Gilead. That you've had that ointment, that blood, that forgiveness offered to you, and you rejected it. So you might say, oh, pastor, I don't want that. I, I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I want to have my sins forgiven. I, 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 I want to make sure that when I die, that I'm ready. But well, here's what you do. You just admit it. Just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve any bit of ointment or forgiveness. Everything that I've done, I, I know that it wasn't right and I've offended you. But I also know that my good works will never get me to heaven because heaven is so perfect. So I can't make the balm, the ointment, 
I can't even personally apply this ointment. I'm coming to you and I'm so desperately lost, so broken, so tried. I need you, Lord. And I'm coming to you just as I am a sinner. And I'm placing my faith in you as the only hope to get into heaven. I know it is not by my works of righteousness, but it's your mercy. I know that it's by faith alone in you that gets the forgiveness of sin. And I'm trusting in you right now. Now, my friend, I pray you'll call upon the name of the Lord to be your Savior. He's gone through the trials. He's beat the trials, death and resurrection. And he's in heaven right now, ready to forgive you of your sin. Is there anyone in here today that today you're going to accept the balm of Gilead, the ointment of his blood and his forgiveness by placing your faith in Christ alone? And you now would like for me to remember you in my prayer. Now, yeah, you should tell others. That's important for you to do. But that's post being a part of this. That's afterwards. But right now, the getting into heaven is an internal act of faith and faith alone in Christ. So here he is, the great physician, went through the pain, offers to you eternal life. All you have to do is to come to him with your simple faith and trust in him. Is there anyone in here today that would place their faith alone in Christ? And now you'd like for me to remember you in prayer. Anyone? Okay. All right, Christians, you can talk about that with your friends if you brought them and continue that discussion if you'd like at an appropriate time. But now let me speak to the rest of the believers in here now. Are you going through a trial? Are you going through something right now? Did God speak to you about knowing how that these trials are going to come. They're inevitable. They're unpredictable. They're many faceted, but they have purpose. Do you know that now? Knowing it sometimes helps you get through it. And then what are you going to do? Are you going to rejoice? It's not a Pollyanna thing. It's a genuine rejoicing because you know that he will not give you more than you can bear, that it does have purpose, that you will be better because of it, and that there's good going to come down the other side, but it's going to take faith but you're going to rejoice in this because you know that it's not out of control. Your trials are not out of control. They're under God's loving control. And he's doing this not because he's angry with you. He's doing this because he loves you. And this is part of the divine design of life. So will you rejoice? Will you request him and say, Lord, help me to understand this so I can get through it. Let me learn every lesson. Help me to use this as a teachable time to teach others. Teach me more of your word through this, Lord. So show me where in your word I should go. And then finally, will you just rest in him? That's where you just trust and you let it go and say, Okay, God, I'm not literally free-falling through life. That you are lovingly carrying me in your sweet hands. And even though I have pain and trials, you will set me down gently in heaven. And I thank you for that. I rest in you. Is there anyone here today that would like to have prayer? And I'd like to come alongside you in my closing prayer and pray for you. For whatever trial you might be going through. You're not denying it. But you're saying, I'd like to have some prayer. So that I can get everything out of this trial I can. So I can become a better person, partner, parent, provider, professional person, whatever. And you'd like to have prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's neat to see some of the young people do this. I want you to know that young people have pain too. And their pain is a little different than our pain, but it's just as painful to them. And it's just as important for them to know who the balm of Gilead is now in their life. So when they go through something deeper later, that they do not uh, curse God, but they rejoice in it. So I thank you, young people. Drill deep into this message. Father, I thank you for today. We are going to thank you in all things and for all things, for this is the will of God concerning us, and your will is perfect, and you have the right. At the same time, Lord, we're going to bless you at all times and praise you because whatever happens brings out the character of Christ, and we're better people, and we want to thank you for that. Now, Father, I do pray for any that's going through unusual trials, that they know that they do not need to go through it alone, that we are to share one another's burdens and we're to bear one another's burdens. So I pray they will share it and we will bear it to the throne of grace.
In Jesus' name, amen. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.